Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Games Institute podcast. I am your co-host, Tobin Rossico. And I'm your co-host slash kind of guest. <laughs> yeah, Marisa is here with us for the last time. Yeah. And we are spotlighting her and all the work that she's done for the podcast and for the Games Institute and in general as a farewell. And then we're going to put her on a boat and send her down the St. Lawrence River. <laughs> In a funeral, a Viking funeral. That is the metaphor I've been using, eh? Did you do that on purpose? No, it's just oh, fitting. In my, in my farewell note to the Games Institute uh, community, I said something along the lines of, like, the Games Institute is this wonderful island of collaboration, <laughs> like, this collective ecosystem, and I'm sailing away from it for now, you know? <laughs> Yeah, there'll always be remnants of you there, but physically, you have to let it go for now. So it's my understanding that you just finished a multi-page report about all of the things that you've done at the Games Institute. So why don't we start with some of the most notable ones that you're still thinking about, and then we'll get into some specifics about the podcast, and uh, we'll see what happens from there. Okay, okay, cool. Well, um... If you don't mind, I'll just say to the listeners, in case they don't know yet, the, what's happening in my life is I'm starting law school in September, somewhat inspired by the work that I've been doing in the Games Institute. Like, there's certainly influences in there, but mostly because of what's happening in the world, I want to go out and dig into some law. So, Neil and Agata, Neil, executive director of the Games Institute, and Agata, and, and oh no, Agata and Kevich. I always have to have so much coffee. Um, <laughs> they're checking my white privilege. Anyway, so <laughs> Neil and Agata gave me permission for the past three months of my job to sort of dig into all of the work that I've done as the research communications officer and evaluate in some way if it's been effective and what we okay, cool. learned from it. Yeah, so this. This report, they gave me complete free reign over what it would look like, and I ended up submitting something under 50 pages, but definitely more than 40 pages. <laughs> and it includes in it um, some environmental scan of what mm -hmm. it means to do knowledge mobilization and knowledge translation, some thematic analysis stuff that I did with the um, statements that all of the Games Institute members wrote for our Senate renewal, as well as some impact assessment of uh, our web presence overall. And then okay, I, made, cool. I I concluded it with a bunch of recommendations. So I think like the, the highlight for me personally was endeavoring to understand how to evaluate research communications separate from research impact. Um, and that was really challenging. Since people talk about research impact, research impact, research impact, they don't talk about what it means to like successfully just communicate about work. Mm -hmm. Research impact looks at successful findings implemented into the world, whereas research communications could be about research that failed, research that never came to be, or just brainstorming, or stories about the researchers like we do on the podcast. And then if that was impactful to other people in some way, or to the researchers themselves. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I, I, it's always easier to be on the side of interviewer for me than to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't it weird having to talk about yourself? Oh, it's so weird. Finding I, the balance of like how much is too much or whatnot. Yeah, I know. You, you tell me, is that is that enough? Is that too much? No, I think that's great. So my follow-up to that would be, so we had game studies with Neil the summer, I guess spring semester of 2018. Now that feels like a long time ago. So that's three years that you've essentially been part of the Games Institute. So what did m knowledge mobilization look like when you started? And what do you think has been your greatest success over the course of your term there? Terms, whatever. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. So um, what you're, I think what you're alluding to is is the fact that like when I was in game studies as a researcher myself, like in mm -hmm. the course, yep. um, I created a game as a knowledge mobilization tool to help people understand um, the politics between building pipelines on Turtle Island. Mm -hmm. So it was like a cooperative play where people had to negotiate and have, uh, they took on different personas for 
different stakeholders in pipeline politics, and then they had to negotiate with each other to find good solutions. And it was it was all about the challenge of actually working with people to advance their interests without without compromising your own interests or without stomping on their feeling, you know, like their priorities, not right. your own priorities. Anyway, so that's kind of that was the early days of me even thinking about what knowledge mobilization could be. I thought that it could start and end with a game, but then Neil. Uh, hired me to do research communications for the Institute and instead thought it prompted me to start thinking bigger about how we could communicate research with the world. You cannot, every single time you have a problem, decide to make a board game about it. <laughs> um, so that, that was a huge shock. <laughs> um, and research, in, research communications at the Games Institute more or less didn't exist. It was sort of just a bunch of news items, I guess, that talked about milestones um, and posters, which are absolutely wonderful, the big, big posters on the walls. But as far as like telling original stories about Games Institute research and spotlighting researchers through different venues in multimedia formats like that, we weren't doing that yet. But we, we had a whole bunch of pieces, right? Like we were running events um to give people platforms and we were working with central communications to write press releases so part of my job was identifying how to pull all of that together and raise it up get it further into the world and then also figure out where there were stories that we were missing and work with researchers to tell those stories right so it's the two pieces how do we amplify it further and how do we broaden what kinds of stories we're putting on platforms Right. And that's part of, you know, where this podcast came to be. Right. So I wanted to jump back to that point, too, because I, like, we both started the Games Institute basically at the same time with that course, right? Because we had, we were desk buddies, essentially. We had our pods yeah. next to each other. And um, and so then you became staff and I stayed as a, as a student researcher. And I don't remember exactly when or what the motivation was to do a podcast. I just remember you saying, hey, I want to do this podcast. And I was like, yep, I'll help. So what were the conversations like with Neil or Agata or whoever else was involved? And was that something that you threw out? Was it something that we talked about and then you went back to them with it? I don't remember how this happened. Do you? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, I do. Yeah, and I don't know actually where you came into it. I don't other than either. other than like I think you were itching to start your own podcast. I've been talking yeah. about doing a D&D podcast for a long time after starting the D&D yeah. with you and and all the other ladies from the games or game studies course as well. Yes, yeah. So, okay, at the time I was really trying to figure out what other people were doing with knowledge translation and research mm -hmm. communications. This was about two and a half years ago. So, 6 months into me doing my job, right? Yeah. Uh, so for the timeline's sake, I started my job three years ago. Uh, the first little while I was just getting my bearings on what the Games Institute was all about. And then about six months in, I started to think about how to get more innovative with what we could do, since mm -hmm. the Games Institute is a very innovative place. So I started investigating what other institutes around the world were doing with their, their knowledge translation. Oh, OK, cool. And then I started also just looking at what individual researchers were doing how they were reaching people. And then there was this one uh, podcast in particular that I thought was absolutely incredible. It was Radio Labs podcast. Um, and I just got so into the way that they told the stories. They told the stories through centering people. Mm -hmm. So instead of um, talking about the bare bones facts of something in very, um, I don't know, technical terms, they went to the people and let them talk about themselves and share their experiences with the material in a narrative for format. Mm -hmm. So, so somewhat autoethnographical, but also a lot of just like personal observations about what they thought was cool, but whatever topic they were saying. And then at the same time, I started to run a blog called Research Spotlight. And that would go into a little bit more detail about whatever project was going on. Um, so to back it up a little bit, like. There's news items which are snapshots about major milestones. And then there are press releases that 
talk about really important findings. So I wanted a middle ground for that, and that was the Research Spotlights blog, which okay. did a deep dive into the process behind the project and the hopes of the researchers for where the project would go in the future. It was sort of this like really, really fun uh, blog style article, right? right. Um, and then in order to write those articles, I had to sit down with researchers and figure out what they were doing. <laughs> and once I was yeah. doing that and having coffee with them, we just got to chatting about where they went in their career, what, what made them really excited, and what their families thought about the work that they were doing, what kind of games they were playing on the side. And so you have, I have that experience of having those coffee interview moments with mm -hmm. like, re with listening to podcasts that other people do, were doing. And I just said, oh my gosh, like, why am I having this experience just to myself? That's right. really selfish. I should let the world hear it. And then I came to your desk and I said, hey, do you want to do this with me since you're the sound guy? And also you know games and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I also think you bought me like a couple bubble teas off the start to help motivate me to leave the pod and stuff or something. I just remember because we had to go record <laughs> in that really weird lab mm -hmm. in EV2. Oh my e gosh, it was e a whole journey. Yeah. Yeah, so we I had to cross to campus. Yeah, until I eventually just, I'm gonna sit on the floor. Until eventually I just said to Neil and Agata, um, like, can't we get this equipment and then just make researchers use it for their own purposes too? Yeah, which was a huge blessing because having it in house was so much easier than fighting with. Because do you remember? Do you remember where we went and recorded our podcast with Alex? It was like up in that weird thing that didn't seem like it was structurally yeah. sound because you'd sit and you would kind of like shift and move with it or whatever it was that was oh weird. it was it was a weird space pod yeah yeah it felt like we were in an astronaut simulator yeah exactly yeah all right so what do you think has been or have been some of the the most prominent takeaways of doing the podcast specifically so things you've learned, things you've learned about the medium, uh, promotions, or just dealing with people, getting them kind of over that initial hurdle of what you're experiencing now of how do I talk about myself and not seem, you know, really self-centered or whatever, but actually genuine and, and express to others their interests and research. Huh. Um, okay. I, what I'm learning currently is that I much prefer being the interviewer <laughs> <laughs> than the interviewee. Um, it is really, really challenging to warm up to talking about yourself and it's a different kind of conversation where I'm not turning it back to you and asking mm -hmm. you a question when you're doing normal conversation with, with your friends. It's yeah, there's a, a balance, a give and take. But as an yeah. interviewee, you're expected to carry the main thread of it all, right? Exactly. And the interviewer asks a question maybe they take like 30 seconds to say it and then <laughs> and then interviewee has to speak for five minutes so yeah. that's very very foreign but i think that what i've noticed happens what i've noticed happens is the person will warm up after a couple of questions and be able to gauge how much of their own story to tell and that's when things really really start to spark since you're giving them an opportunity probably for the first time in their life mm -hmm. to work on how to express themselves and tell their own story. It's a different kind of agency. Yeah. And a lot of people, especially academics, they're very used to having to contain what they're saying so much so that they rehearse it so many times and, and <laughs> it up that it's not even their own voice. Yeah. And then a lot of the time after we would record the podcast, what we'd hear from people is that in a way we help them just to discover their voice. They figured out that they want to reorder their dissertation dissertation mm -hmm. chapters, that they wanted to trim some of those chapters out and add a new one, that they finally figured out a way to communicate what they were working on with their family, which is my favorite takeaway, <laughs> um, that they figured out how to talk to their grandparents about what they're working on. So I, I don't know, I guess that's a huge highlight for me is that we realize the podcast isn't just for the listeners or mm. for the Games Institute's mission. It's also for the person being interviewed. Um, that it's very transformative. That's really, that's an interesting answer because 
I was thinking about when we started, our podcast lengths would be about 40 to maybe 50 minutes, right? And now they've been pushing even yeah. like an hour and 20 minutes, right? As people really get into a flow. And I think that comes from understanding um, a good pattern of, right? Because it's it's almost like a podcast is like a three-act structure. We start with our kind of origin with games and academics and then kind of what are you doing now? And then what do you want to do? Where do you see yourself going, et cetera, et cetera. So by talking about stuff that they know for certain, the origin of how they started getting into games or their academic journey, they're more prepared and they're kind of lightened up to be able to talk about their research. And then it's that way. So I think part of part of that success story is us and primarily you figuring out a structure for our outline of questions to help kind mm -hmm. of facilitate them getting through those stages and having the confidence to speak about all those parts. So congratulations, yeah. that was really cool. Oh, thank you. I'm just sitting here <laughs> going, yes. But I, uh, I think what's, what I've also realized that I can take away personally is for the longest time, we were trying to make ourselves fit some type of mold where we would mm. say, okay, it has to be under an hour because of this reason or that reason. It has to start off with biographical questions or it has to start off with some context about what their research is doing until we sat back and thought about why, like what purpose is that actually serving? Mm -hmm. And why would we invest energy and effort into containing something when we could let it be free and show us what it needs to do? And I, I, this is something that I kind of do with my whole life is I put parameters on something before I even figure out what would be valid about it. Mm -hmm. um, relinquishing control. And I think that's where uh, we end up having some really, really fantastic conversations. Like you said, I mean, um, behind the scenes a little bit here, but you you and I, Tobin and I had a disagreement a while back about whether or not we should start off the top with some context about the researcher's work from us, like right. a, summary, a summary bit about the episode. And then, well, it was a very short-lived disagreement because <laughs> you just said back, um, well, no, I actually kind of like figuring out who the person is in their personal life before mm. I even care to figure out what their research is. And it flipped it on its head. Um, I don't remember that, but I imagine that would be something I said. It was a very I, weak disagreement because it was only one back and forth. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's And again, this is something that was really cool as we figured out the, the voice of the show or the, the tone of the show it wasn't specifically highlighting their research, it's highlighting them. So yes. whether, like whatever rose to the top, whether it is something that they research or a method, right? There's lots of times where we just focus on people's method um, or how they got into games or, you know, whatever. Like as we talk to them, the kind of essence of that episode starts to shine. And I think that if it if it was at the top being like, you know, this person, like, I don't know. I feel like doing that kind of bio would have just been no different than when you go to a conference and they have like a canned, you know, three lines of this is what they do. And then you do your 10 minutes and then you sit down and then you ask this or you answer the same three questions or whatever. So, yeah, yeah that, I think it's cool that you get to you get to hear about what somebody played with their parents when they were two years old before you even realized that they're a Ph.D. student. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking about, uh, I was going to pull up the, the list, but it was the one guest that we talked to, and they played Playmobil. Oh, Christina, yeah. Yeah, and how that like, informed basically her whole academic like philosophy and stuff, right? Like that kind of stuff. And, and the fact that it's spontaneous and... Right, we're not we're not coming into the episode knowing that those are the points we want to hit. We basically have the same questions for almost every single guest, right? Yeah. For the most part, you know, obviously we are going to ask specifics, but by getting that stuff off of the top, then we can start tying it back in and having some kind of narrative to each episode, which is I think the fun part is as the interviewer going, mm -hmm. okay, how am I going to keep all of this together? How am I going to keep um, these threads and this kind of tone that's self-emerging, right? It's an, an emergent thing yeah. uh, together for all of it. It's been really cool. You're making me um, want to ask myself. 
about mm -hmm. what what the heck inspired me to pursue law. Like, yeah. Okay, help help me figure out what in my childhood now brought me to this point. Um. All right. So, <laughs> what was or what situations can you think of as uh, as a as a child or youth where you saw other people unable to stand up for themselves and you were the voice of reason or advocate for them oh mm -hmm. like all the time with my my family my siblings i don't want to hurt anybody's feelings here but i feel like um my sibling is very passive mm -hmm. and i would notice a lot of people taking advantage of that there's this one memory I have too of, um, I don't know, it's a push and pull. It's a push and pull, <laughs> right? Because even as I remember this story, it's interesting. So there's, there's a tradition on my dad's side of the family where we would all get together for birthdays. Mm -hmm. And the biggest privilege was getting to lick the candles off once you blew them out, like okay. the icing off the candles, right? right? And our tradition was that the parents would give their candles to the kids. Okay. The smallest, silliest little thing was that you would always be so excited when it was your parents' birthday because they would take the candles off and let you lick off the icing. And when it was my mom's birthday, she took off the candles and instead let my cousins lick off the icing. <gasps> Betrayal. I know honestly shook me to my core and then i'm i'm i was the younger sibling and my older sibling just did she, she didn't say anything and i was shocked and i wanted to get her in there uh, to advocate yeah. i still felt too young i didn't have my own voice yet and then so yeah i did and i, I caused the trouble and my mom was like later she was like you know what honestly we have really great things in life we're really happy. We don't need to keep things for ourselves when it could be just as easily given away. Mm. Um, again, we're talking about the icing at the bottom of the candles here. It's right. serious. Yeah. But, but it was such a pivotal moment for me for three reasons. One, I realized that um, not only was nobody going to stick up for me, but they weren't going to stick up for themselves. Two, um, I at that moment was branded as sort of like not a mouthpiece but uh like i spoke my mind and mm -hmm. i wasn't passive and i was a little bit of a snotty kid and then the third thing i realized was that like sometimes justice doesn't actually look like laying things out equally mm -hmm. or sticking with the rules you know sometimes you have to interpret them through what's actually right for the situation um, but then, yeah, I guess like throughout the rest of my childhood, there were always moments where um, somebody would try to take advantage of my sister's kindness and I would mm -hmm. step in and, um, you know, she would get labeled as the really, really kind person and I would get labeled as the really bossy person, but it never felt right to just let the injustice go unspoken. Mm -hmm. How's that? Uh, well, that's for you to judge. Does that feel like an adequate response? Yeah, it, I mean, honestly, it feels like something that's been true of me my whole life, which is that like, I really, really want to put out kindness into the world and let people live happily and get what, get what they want. But then there's the stopping point and it's always where injustice happens. Mm -hmm. And and that's where you'll start to see a completely different side of me where I can't let it go. Yeah. And it's really hard because I get sort of misunderstood sometimes I think where people will say that I'm rude or mm -hmm. mean, but in my head, I have to just accept it because I'm not willing to live in a world, or I'm not living to be complicit in a world where you let things go that should be fought against. Right. Yeah. So the follow-up I had for that was, um, so my experience of coming to know you as a person in your ideologies, I think, stands in line with that because I didn't we didn't really do much together until game studies when we started playing D&D &D. mm. 
And so what I rec or what I remember of you in all the different courses was that like I remember being in McDonald's rhetoric course and you'd speak up often and push back against either other students' comments or his own uh, points and stuff like that. And you know, it it stuck in my head. I don't think there was anything that we had together the second term, I don't remember, of the masters, but that course specifically, because I was like, hey, this is somebody who wants to um to get her point across and to make sure that it's like it was almost it was almost a way of you kind of finding out the boundaries of you know we we're talking about rhetoric but you'd still be like you know if he's talking or if this person if this rhetorician is talking about like this like how far does that go what are the what are the limitations of that kind of thing and then i remember frequently when somebody would make a comment you'd be like well that's not true <laughs> you would stick <laughs> up and you'd say you know you'd interject and and be like, you have to consider this point as well. So I think uh, that's that's accurate <laughs> based on my recollections of you before uh, I really got to know you. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. I I don't know. I, it did take me a really long time to come to terms with because, yeah, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I think that now that I'm more of an adult, I'm willing to lose friendships over it because if you have a friend who Oh, <laughs> sorry. If you have if you have people in your life who are um, ideologically opposed to you at the expense of another person's human rights, mm -hmm. you know, it's challenging because you want to support people in having their own opinions, but you have to have some boundaries to that if the opinions are really dangerous. Yeah. Um, and you obviously, like, obviously, I, I give people chances, but. I don't know, there has to be some kind of a line. Yeah. And and besides, like, you can live and let live without having people over for coffee all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. So I wanted to ask, how did, how did the podcast specifically prepare you for what comes next? Do you think that it improved your... Um, like interpersonal communication skills? Did it help you read people better or anything like that? What What are the takeaways that helped you develop skills and talents that will be useful for this next phase of your life? Hmm. Oh, I, I, truly in so many ways, I think it helped. Yeah, I mean, my whole job is, my whole job in order to do it well, I had to kind of give the spotlight over. Mm -hmm. Um, and for anybody who knows me, I love the spotlight. I love sharing the spotlight, but I, I want to be in it. If you so. play D&D with her, you'll know exactly how difficult it is for <laughs> Marisa to give the spotlight to anybody else. Exactly. And when you have to, when, you, when you're going to be helping people pursue justice, I think it's really important to know what they actually want and you cannot impose your own thoughts over them. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, obviously, like you're you're sharing, you have the knowledge, but to help people navigate the legal system, if they're your client, like they have to be, you know, enthusiastically consenting to um, the kind of representation that you're providing. I think mm -hmm. I could be wrong. You know what? Like I'm not in law school yet. Maybe I'm wrong <laughs> about that. I really hope I'm not. But I I think having the podcast really trained me to be an active listener mm -hmm. and to not try and jump in and put in my own thoughts. Like there were often, often times on this podcast where the guest was saying something that I, I very much disagreed with, but it wasn't my place to step in because it was their story. You mm -hmm. know, it was their episode. If, if somebody was crossing the line at any point, I probably would have stepped in. Nobody ever took it that far. It was always more so silly things, but, um, oh my gosh. You silence your phone and then it still doesn't get silent. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I think I learned how to be an active listener and I learned how to really appreciate what somebody was saying. I learned how to recognize when somebody was giving an answer, how to help them get that information further, mm -hmm. right? Which is a really challenging thing since a lot of time in conversation, you're just thinking about what you need from it. Yeah. But to anticipate what a listener tuning into that conversation would need from it requires different thinking. And so you have to respond, not for your own benefit, but from for the benefit of another person. Yeah. And and that's something, you know, one day if I'm ever 
working with a client um, and I need them to provide different information, I have to anticipate those moments of what needs to be said. Um, being really, really present with people is also really challenging. You know, as you can see, I keep getting distracted by my own phone because I'm not trying to like be that active person here since now it's, you know, for my sake and not for mm -hmm. somebody else's. But if there were, a, you know, a guest here that we were with, I think it would be a very different thing because I've now learned how to be present. Yeah. So, yeah. It's been a blessing, truly, to get myself out of my own head, my own interests, and collaborate with you on that. And yeah, that's that's another thing that's really helped is I've been able to take your lead on a lot of things um, because you should never ever assume that your own, um, your own unresearched feelings about something are correct. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to be able to look to you and gauge your reaction, you know? Occasionally, I'll come back from an episode and think, oh, there was that middle part that was just so boring. And you'll go. <laughs> that was my favorite enough. part. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'll think, oh, yeah, you know what? It is just me being very uninterested in X, Y, Z type of game. So the the question from there then is, did you or have you come to the point after I just closed iTunes? Mm -hmm. I don't remember how many. We're at, we're at 30 some, I think, almost 40. Yeah. After that many episodes, do you still hate the sound of your voice recorded? Oh, um, remember that <laughs> same remember that same sibling I was talking about a few minutes ago, being uh -huh. very passive and not standing up for herself. Well, she listened to the podcast and she went, "Oh, your voice is so funny." Oh no, <laughs> this isn't what you actually sound like. You sound so weird. So, I thought I did, and then <laughs> <laughs> that's not nice. Oh, I feel did. like. She, I, I deserved it. Don't worry. <laughs> I feel like I have a bit of a, like a podcast voice that I do when I record. So maybe that's just, you've fallen into like the cadence of, you know, host Marisa is different yeah. than, you know, whatever else, but that's funny. I think it's, I think it's fine. I, I mean, it'd be kind of impossible to be your true self all the time. And especially when you can see in the little corner what you look like, of course you're self-monitoring. Yeah, that's why I don't like doing video podcasts. Because now yeah. I'm like, does my shirt look good? You know, whatever, that stuff. I never worry about when it's just audio. With audio, we're like eating donuts and listening to people talk and it's fine. Yes, you can sit back. And with the one that we did with Nicholas Hoban where we were online with uh -huh. that video, that one felt so much more relaxing, even though we were stressed out about trying to coordinate with each other. Yeah. <laughs> question yeah um i was gonna say after that then do you think that part of so you mentioned that part of the things you learned is kind of prompting or or prodding for more either clarification or just more depth do you find that you've developed any talents of people of kind of reassuring or comforting people when they start talking because i know a lot of guests right we, can, we had this idea of everybody wearing headphones so they can hear the questions better or whatever. And a lot of people said, no, I don't want to listen to myself. Mm. And so with the, the question is two-parted. Do you think that you've found ways to reassure people when it comes to crossing some kind of threshold of their fears? And then two, do you think that our guests go back and listen to these? Do, these, do you think they use them in some way as like a portfolio piece? beyond just the games is do pushing it out and randoms from all over the world listening to it? I think it depends on who it is mm -hmm. and, and at what stage they are in their career. Th that's a challenging thing because as much as we're giving people the space to talk about themselves and have the agency over the way their narrative unfolds, they still have a lot of work into gaining the confidence. And this is something that's generally true mm. for people in academia. The, the reality of academia is that it's very isolating. And unlike a lot of other work environments, you're working for yourself, by yourself, advocating for yourself most of the time. Mm -hmm. When you're sitting with a supervisor, it's about you. So you don't really gain a lot of um, reassurance from other people. 
and you don't get to hide behind the team. Right. It's you on center stage all the time. And so a lot of people get into their late 20s, their 30s, their 40s, their 50s in academia without ever having the type of confidence that you gain from working on a, a team like I have. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I've, I've been on a team at the Games Institute for the past three years. And so even though I'm working in very, very close proximity to all of these other academics, I, I have behind me the support of two wonderful supervisors and a lot of fabulous team members that can look at my work and say, no, that's good. Or can be very critical without it hitting my own ego. Right. I can't be critical to what you're doing in your dissertation without it being you because it is about you, yeah. right? It's your dissertation. So a lot of, a lot of confidence comes from um, receiving criticism, or receiving feedback, and separating your own ego from that. Anyway, so to to, to circle back to what you were asking, do you think that pe do I think that people use this as a portfolio piece, or look back on it and gain the confidence in what they're saying and their own voice? No, <laughs> right? I I think maybe one or two have, hmm. but maybe over the next few years once their experiences sort of get more distanced from that particular moment in their career then they will they will have the ability to look oh, back on it and feel confident. Yeah. it's just too close it's too much like it's too personal that's weird so i'm gonna i'm gonna pull the spotlight over to me for a second because i think that what you said is really interesting because as I, yeah i agree as academics you sit in the library in your or your basement as we are now and uh it's all about you and i think that's interesting because recently i've done uh two-ish two or three interviews and one i've went back and listened to because it was quick it was only a half hour and my purpose for that is i listened to them to know what i missed so that the next time i talk about these kinds of things, I can be more thorough. Mm -hmm. But then the other part of me is agreeing with what you said, where like years down the line, they might have that confidence, right? And so the reason why when you said to me, hey, we want to do this podcast, do you want to help out? And I immediately said, yes, is because I've been doing podcasts since 2015, I think. Mm -hmm. And so I had a lot, I mean, that's not that three years-ish of experience and stuff. And I was, I was, interviewing people who were uh, like best-selling authors and blah, blah, like that kind of stuff, right? And so I think that's where that kind of persona was developed. And so I feel like what you said is true where, right, there was, there was someone, they did a brown, no, it wasn't a brown bag. They did a pres lecture, like an English pres lecture. They had never mm. presented at a conference before. That was their first presentation of their own research in front of a body. And I think that that level of inexperience probably was also present in a lot of the people that we interviewed as podcast guests, right? Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't have had even, a, like, they wouldn't have done a brown bag. They wouldn't have done a conference. They're probably very nervous to get up in front of a class and, and talk about stuff or read a paper or whatever. So I guess the, this is the long way of saying I agree and do you think then that that is something that we should have recognized earlier of the mission of the podcast and done something more to help develop that confidence? Um, hmm. Or that's do you think tricky. that that's just out of our hands and that's something that comes from? Yeah, well, I, my, my instinct is to say that the that it needs to be bigger than than just the podcast. The podcast can be a piece of it, though. Mm -hmm. I, I think this this connects really nicely with what research communications, knowledge translation, knowledge mobilization, what it's all doing, mm -hmm. and how it functions for the researcher. Um, since I think like this is also about just self distancing from what you're able to say, so. If you were to talk about your research and know that you're trying to represent your research, that's not you. It's you, but it's not right. you trying it's to your justify product. yourself. It's your product. Yes. Yeah. And so you can write a paper about it. You can um, c contribute to an article that goes into media relations for a press release about it. 
you can give a talk about it, but if you're up center stage and somebody says to you, oh, I don't think that this research is actually worthwhile, suddenly that crosses into the territory of threatening you, mm-hmm. your decision to do the research. If you talk about the, this is why actually at the Canada Canadian Game Studies Association conference, as well as the Narrative and Game Studies Association conference, there's rules for conduct that say you can question what's happening in the research, but you cannot question the choices behind um, what the research is. Yeah, because one addresses the product and one addresses the producer. The producer, exactly. So um, the way that I think about it is researchers and academics are trained to talk about the the work, the product, but they're not trained to talk about themselves. They're not trained to advocate for themselves. They're not like other people out in the real world. (laughs) I scratched that real world thing. (laughs) (laughs) This is my own, uh, this is my own imposter syndrome coming through because I chose to spend the past 10 years in academia too. Um, What I mean to say is they're not like trained to negotiate for salaries. Right. you know, like as a master's student, we were given the rates for TA ships and that was that. Yeah. We weren't told that like we as people were able to say that we are worth more and we don't want to opt into this funding package. It was pre-assigned <laughs> and it's been that way for a long time. Yeah. So the person is always removed from the research. And this is why I think that the podcast part is a step towards that since it's in a lot of ways, like the only opportunity people get to talk about who they are as people. I, actually, um, there was a PhD defense that I was at, Emma Vossens. She talked about um, her autograph, autoethnographical work and she's published it online. So I, I feel okay to, to mention it. Um, it's publicly available. And her stuff was a lot about like her own experiences with her work. And it was so cool and so radical mm. to see. You know, she talked about like her own experiences as a way to produce research that was blending the personal and the, you know, scholarship. But um, otherwise, it's very divorced from each other. Right. So the podcast can be the first moment that people can talk about themselves. But that first moment isn't enough to, to build in the confidence. I think that um, we need to have more well-rounded training. We need to encourage people to think about themselves as individual workers and not just individual producers. Um, And also, like, we need to start undermining the merits of imposter syndrome and get people to stop saying things like the real world when they talk about outside of academia. I will never in my own head live that down. So I was going to say that the thing that your comments made me think of specifically from the podcast is... I feel like, and again, this is two-ish years ago, the reason why those early ones were short is because we talked a lot about, or we tried to focus a lot about research, right? I think our goal back then was, let's talk about the research and try to break it down into layman terms so that everybody can understand. It was almost like, rather than read this person's paper, listen to this podcast and you'll get the the gist of it. I think that's kind of where we started. And then we realized, let's not do that let's just mm-hmm. focus on the person, right? Because I remember when we were doing the naming conventions for each episode, we were trying to figure out, do we talk, do we label it, you know, the title of their research or do we title it whatever? And we eventually came across, or we came down to the, the decision of, we're going to name it, you know, this and this with this person. And it was kind of mm-hmm. their, it was their time to shine. And I think that realization helped what you, uh, or helped, guide us with what you were saying where rather than you know each of us have the paper in front of us and go on paragraph three line two you use right this kind of phrasing to to meet right we weren't breaking down research we were getting towards their method their history why they chose this what challenges they've had whatever so we were making it about them and so then if you listen to the podcast and then go and read their research it's almost more, you can understand more because you realize where it's coming from or where it Mm -hmm. wants to go or whatever, rather than us doing kind of like a book club and just (laughs) talking about their research, right? I think think that's uh, very effective. Because a lot of it gets cropped out and, and those are the things that would actually help you understand it more. Like what gets cropped out is 
their personal experiences with it. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to my probably main reason for being interested in podcasts and why I did podcasts back in the day was yeah. I don't subscribe to the philosophy of death of the author, mostly <laughs> because the people that I read uh, are still alive. And so if they're still alive, why would you not want to go and get more behind the scenes of the the struggles or the successes or whatever mm. of creating this thing, right? And so I, I think about that with comic books. I think about that with video games, research, whatever, is if, if the person's still alive, like they have the ability to comment on it. And I was in Professor Randy Harris's course once. Mm. I don't remember what the title was. Uh, it was the first one I took with him. And we read a paper by him and this one person said, like, is it weird that we're reading a paper that you wrote? And he goes, oh, that Randy Harris is not this Randy Harris. And I was like, what are you talking? Like, you could literally tell us what this paper is about because you're right here. And that always bugs me <laughs> because I like my philosophy is if I can go to the creator and ask them about the creation, that's much more meaningful to me to learn about their mindset and the objectives and challenges and all that kind of stuff rather than reading a piece of of something they've published so from a podcast standpoint yeah. and as somebody who wants to learn about the, the people creating these things oh. that is much more meaningful than again we're going to do a book club and, and analyze this person's research and they're going to be kind of telling us whether we're right or wrong right mm -hmm. there's all that kind of stuff so yeah i think that's been a help for i mean it's been a help for me because I get to perpetuate my philosophies. But I think that, like you said, they'll look back at these podcasts in a couple of years and go, ah, that was a, hopefully a pivotal moment, whether for themselves as a confidence uh, booster or whether it was something that helped them figure out a roadblock or a closed door on, on their research and be able to get them past something or whatever. But yeah, I, I, I see what you mean much clearly like I think that that's the other half to my approach you know like I'm I'm thinking so much about the fullness of the story and you're talking a lot about the intrigue of the creator mm -hmm. and oh I had so many thoughts spinning off of that <laughs> um Okay, well, I, I'll buy myself a little bit of time to figure out what I was going to say, but I'll throw in a quick anecdote. The other day, I was at a cafe, and I looked up and realized that the person at the table next to me was the lead singer of one of my favorite bands in the world, one of the most popular bands in Canada, like Grammy winning, all this stuff. Was it Lights? I don't know who else lives in Toronto. I, I don't want to say who it was, just in case what I say next it would be. Like, okay, bad, you can tell I me afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> and I I was sort of internally freaking out, but also trying to stay present with the person I was having coffee with so that I could like, <laughs> still listen to her and be a good friend. But I was eavesdropping a little bit. And all I heard them say was they, they've got this show coming up and it's a huge deal because it's at the end of COVID and mm -hmm. um, at a major, major venue. And they're trying to sell all the tickets that they possibly can because like, there's a lot of people they need to pay. There's a lot of time that they need to account for all this stuff. And this person, the lead singer of the band says to the person that they're with, you know, they go, honestly, whether or not it's 40% sold out or 100% sold out, when I get back up on that stage, it's going to feel like all of the people in the world are there to see me. That's really cool. And I just went, oh. <laughs> because that's that's the behind the scenes yeah you know like that's the feeling of the person up there and that's the thing that every single person at that concert would want to know is it doesn't matter you know how many people are there it doesn't matter who you are or where you came from or how insignificant you feel in a crowd which I certainly do what you mean to that person up on the stage is as much as what they mean to you that's exactly right. And that's why that's why I think that for these creative outlets, I mean, the, the snootiness of literature and academia from my undergrad is still causing me to kind of prickle and bristle because these people uh, were so, I feel like, so old school when it came to that kind of thinking. But it's exactly that sentiment that you just voiced where if I can get to know the creator and have that kind of connection, not so much like 
like I'll I'll appreciate a, a book that somebody did, but maybe not the next book. But if I can get to know them and maybe some of the struggles or you know again challenges, successes, whatever of creating that book, maybe I'll go, oh, I'll give it a shot and I'll look at it in a different light. And then that's also what's so detrimental about social media and giving everybody a voice because you have yes. wonderful people like, you know, Neil Gaiman, for example, who's this stellar stand up individual. And then you have situations like with maybe JK Rowling where you go, you shouldn't be allowed on these platforms because yeah. we don't want you to say these kinds of things to ruin the perception of your books. Right. Because that's what bugs me is people aren't able to separate that kind of stuff sometimes. So. I think I think I'm figuring out how this all comes together. <laughs> like I think that um, you and I both share this fascination with relating to people, where mm -hmm. it's not enough to read anything removed or in isolation. We have to know the person behind it, what they were thinking and feeling. And for you, I think, if I may, you can you know verify this afterwards mm -hmm. like for you it turns into um the mindset and the creator and the relationship with the object and the relationship with the the reader the player and for me it turns into like helping people relate to each other in a better way mm -hmm. the, the reason why I got really interested in knowledge translation knowledge mobilization in the first place was because I saw firsthand how incredible and how valuable research is and how much potential it has to change the world and make the human condition better, mm -hmm. as well as the environmental condition. It, how, how it can just elevate life. But then I also saw that it was getting trapped inside the walls of you know, the ivory tower. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to help bridge that gap and, and pull it out into the world. And I guess thereby connect the researcher with the, the um, stakeholders a little bit more. And then now I'm turning that into a legal career, I hope, where I can um, use this thing that's the fabric of our society, the legal system, and work inside of it to improve it in certain ways to help people relate to each other better. Um, so yeah, like I think it's all it's all a part of it. The the more that we appreciate the people who are living and existing around us, the better we'll all live. And the way to do that, I think, is through like stories about who they are, what they're mm -hmm. trying to achieve, what gets them passionate, and what games they're playing. And that, that's the thing that I was thinking about before that I really wanted to add on to it is like I um, really, really needed you in this to, mm -hmm. to make the podcast what it was because you are what changed the podcast from talking about the research and having the researcher just comment on it to asking them questions about what games they play and who they are in their lives. Like I was so fixated on just this one thing, which is, you know, tell us about your research from your perspective. And you were like, no, tell us about the perspective in your research. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's so much bigger. And, and you know what? I'm going to take that with me in my whole life and be okay with kind of talking about things on tangents. I get stressed out a little bit when things go off on a tangent and I'm like, okay, we probably have an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we want to make sure we get all the, the points in here, but, but what you've taught me is that we cannot know what needs to be said until we sit down and ha start to have the conversation. Yeah, that's right. And that's why it's so fun being a podcast interviewer is because you do have to be like locked in. Mm -hmm. And if they say something that wasn't planned, you can keep pulling on that. And I think you do that really well. There's lots of times where you'll, you know, you always say probably once per episode, there's so many things rattling around in my brain and then you have to take a deep breath and then you retell what they've just said. And then you say, all right, and now this is where we're going to go. And you're <laughs> off on like another, another part of it. But yeah. And I think what was really helpful with our development as um, figuring out all this stuff was getting rid of that time crunch. Cause I remember we started saying, you know, podcast episode should be 45 minutes. Cause that's, you know, kind of a commute length or whatever, but what helped with that. And I think helps get the genuineness of our guests is that I don't really edit anymore either. Mm. Right. Unless there's something that needs to be cut out or, you know, somebody has a false start that is kind of embarrassing or whatnot to preserve their, uh, their ethos 
Yeah. I basically cut out us talking about stuff before and then I stop us at a good point because, you know, it's always hard to end them. We'll say thank you so much four or five times and whatnot. But for the most part, we hit start and we talk and then that's it. And so you're you're getting the genuine conversations with people. It's not edited. It's not put together. It's literally just them saying what's on their mind and us kind of helping have some kind of narrative to it for the most part. I don't think we do that too often anymore. What's next then for the podcast? What's your, what's your vision? What's your hope? <sighs> well, I hope that I have some help <laughs> with it. <laughs> I don't know. There's, I think this conversation's helped understand where we're at and where we need to go in terms of right realizing that this is a chance for people to become more comfortable talking about themselves and i would love to do some part twos like we did part two with stewart right we did one and two i mean but stewart has a plus five charisma so it's not like he needed the confidence <laughs> but going, coming back to some people if they're still around and saying you know what have you been up to and, and doing that and making making them shorter i think would be good but that's been helpful to understand um but I think just continuing to give people a platform to talk about themselves and allowing them to share their triumphs and successes and challenges and overcoming those challenges. And the part that I love, and this is the part that I always watch for or listen for when, when we do episodes, is at what point, basically, at what point did either Neil or, oh, it's been too long of a week. Mark? No, the other one. Leonard. Yeah. When did they step in and say, hey, you should come over here? Because I love the situation of, you know, somebody being like, I'm going to research 18th century poetry. And then they take Lord of the Rings from Neil. And then they're like, and I didn't realize you could do this. Kind of, right. Because that's what happened to me. So I always try to find that pearl mm -hmm. in their stories because that's kind of what happened to you. It's what happened to me. And to connect that. So there's always this kind of thread of how they got pulled into the Games Institute, because I think that's one of the beauties of U Waterloo. Because when I was in undergrad, it took me a really long time to find like my people, if you will, in that sense. And thankfully, it was only two semesters before I found that here. And I think that allowing people to talk about that and how much it helped change or guide them or give them direction, which I guess is the same thing, um, helps reaffirm the purpose of the Games Institute and why it needs to exist in some capacity here. Mm. Beyond the research and stuff is like, it just, we need a community. We need the Institute to be there so that like-minded people can be with like-minded people. And even if they're still doing individual research, say like, this is my pod and these are my pod mates and right. Like some of the best experiences I've had at U Waterloo have just been sitting in my chair talking with AC about memories mm -hmm. of playing Diablo 2 or whatever and that's just be and I wouldn't be able to do that if I was in my basement like I was for the first yeah. two semesters of my master's so that kind of community um mm -hmm. is great to perpetuate through the podcast uh but it's definitely going to be in a different form without you I don't know what it's going to be like uh I'm going to have to dust off some question creation talents and stuff like that and figure out how to make it more cohesive because that was always nice just sitting down and you saying, okay, here's what we're asking today. And I hit start <laughs> and then I just go, what well, looks interesting. <laughs> so there's going to be more work, I imagine, for me, unfortunately. But yeah, I think if you um, if you really like leverage the individuality of the different guest hosts that come and sit with you, mm -hmm. that could be very interesting. And it'll require, I, I imagine, relinquishing control over the format. So that's the challenge in itself. But if you can do that and just let it um, feel fresh again, I think that it's going to be really cool. Mm -hmm. And I, and I say that recognizing that, like, you know, that's the very thing that could have it fail. <laughs> yeah, um, there's always that fear, huh? Yeah, but it, I mean, I. I think that there's no way another host could come in and be completely al aligned with like all of the things that we created because so much of it um, was about the time. And now we're going into a new like 
post self isolation world where a lot of the questions are probably going to be changed. A lot of the interest is going to be different. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think that we've also in this hour hit on something really fascinating that I haven't given much thought to and now unfortunately probably can't, um, which is helping to turn the community into more of a place to build like individual confidence or individual self-advocacy, something mm -hmm. like that. That's um, why I always thought there should be more brown bags. So, yeah, so this I, is, a, a, remember that at the top, we talked about this report I was doing. Yeah. Right, and one of the, the I found, I guess, like three or four key realms for it, which realms? looked at realms, realms. Oh, realms, okay. Realms of, yeah, so, so like knowledge community, or sorry, research communications at the Games Institute functions to help improve, um, our, the International Games Institute profile and the international profile of our researchers. It helps to facilitate building relationships between members, helps mm -hmm. to um, like help us reach our target audience, and it helps to improve research literacy, both out externally and internally, so among members. So it's doing those four things. And, I, and then in my head, those are all the ingredients to say that this is turning into um, a really complex ecosystem network. So that knowledge communication, research communication, I always use those terms somewhat interchangeably. Um, they're, they're improving the connections between people. Right. If you think about all of, all of our people like nodes and connections between them, mm -hmm. you know, you have Neil and Leonard somewhat in the center, like you said, <laughs> Mark in the center, and then a lot of their researchers outside of them. So in the past, or I guess if it goes unchecked, we have just sort of separate nodes and then Neil, Mark, uh, Leonard, um, Oliver, like, you know, a lot of the key people, JRS and Einer mm -hmm. and Shanna, they're all connected through the professors, the people who stay the longest, but through the podcast, through the articles, through the brown bags, through the workshops, we start to build connections between more people. We facilitate relationship building, and then we leverage that strength to get the message out further, to um, reach more target audiences, and to improve research literacy among people so that it can just grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, so those are all of the, like, that, that's what I found in the report, right? But then the other thing is, like, how do we then turn it back into the individual, mm, right? right. So, so maybe this is this fifth thing that's the new era of the podcast, the new era of research communications is to like, um, you know, we've spent so much time amplifying it out to the world, but how do we amplify it back into the people right. and look at them and add value inside? That'd be cool. Yeah. Because I remember when we were doing the, I don't remember what it's called anymore, but the Game Studies Guild, like those early meetings, yes. we always yeah. tried to say, do we have like a monthly brown bag where somebody does something so that you get practice or whatever? And yeah, I always thought like as the GI as a whole, there were so many people, you walk past their pod and you see all the things that they're tinkering with and you go, well, I want to know what they're doing. Yeah. But they always look so busy. I always felt bad interrupting, or just, and I'm also just not that charismatic to be like, "Hey, so tell me what you're doing today." But yeah, I think there's definitely value in that and giving them more of a platform to do that. Mm -hmm. All right, so we are oh, almost oh. at an hour and a half. Yes. Okay, we'll close this. Yes, <laughs> I promise. But um, just on what you just said. Like that is a major opportunity with having guest hosts, eh? Mm -hmm. Is you sit them with somebody else, right? Like we know Stuart Halifax is going to come back as a guest host. Right. So maybe part of your job in collaboration with the GI admin team who's going to help you do it is to find the most like radically different person <laughs> yeah. to have Stuart interview. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, then, and then the two of them can you know, be in conversation, can tell the other person how fascinating what they're doing is, right? Become champions for each other. Like the way that the way that we do naturally, because we're hearing all this interesting stuff from our guests and from each other, and we say it properly. So like you recognize what you like, I recognize what I like, and then that bolsters the confidence. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'm happy to, 
I'm happy to close on a note like that, that I'm, I'm really hopeful that not only will the future of the podcast thrive, but it's also going to thrive in this, this other direction we haven't explored yet too. So. Yeah. All right. Well, what is your final words to say to all the listeners who have stuck with us for two and a half years? <laughs> this is your if you could get one per, or you get everybody to play one game question what game oh well, my message for the listeners is that i'm not going away i'm more so trying to figure out like what law can do next right and then my game i would have them play uh, like it's obviously captain's gambit mm. um werewolf 2 but. Oh my goodness, of course it would be werewolf. <laughs> Remember when you came to my gun game studies class and ran that and I just sat in a corner because I did not want anything to do with it? Yeah, do you think they have fun? I, yeah, those that was a great course. The, the students in that course were awesome. I think they talked about it, how they were like, I think she was having more fun than everybody else. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so embarrassing but so true um no it has to be captain's gambit and i want to play i want to play with more people back from the, the gi and people who are listening to the podcast so that's i guess my final words as i look forward to that also remember me when i was young go was back to me? the first episode oh yeah <laughs> i know i actually want to go back there and listen now when we we're still in ev2 yeah i'm gonna wait Pretty a year and then do it i think I don't know. This feels very dramatic um, of a goodbye, but like people have to understand that um, that like I'm I don't know I don't know that this can very well be like the thing I look back on one day as one of the wonderful things that we did. Yeah, so. I agree. All right. Well, on behalf of the whole Games Institute and everybody that we've interviewed and all that stuff before, thank you for your contribution to this and helping build it. And I will do my best to continue on to do a good job. Oh, I trust you. I'm going to I'm going to wait a little while before I listen to an episode <laughs> and then I'll binge them all at once. Yeah. And, and write your list of grievances and you can mail it to me. Oh, no, no, no my list of applause. Thank you for having me on as your host and thank you for indulging my farewell. <laughs>